All right, let's open our Bibles to the book of Romans. And we went rather uh, in-depth, I guess. We probably could have gone even more in-depth and been more deliberate. Uh, We're in chapter 3. We spent uh, the last few weeks looking at uh, this great statement that uh, Paul makes from verses 21 to verse 26. He says, But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness because in His forbearance God has passed over the sins that were previously committed and to demonstrate at the present time His righteousness that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Just such a tremendous statement filled with very key uh, significant um, concepts related to our salvation to understand how we're saved and on what basis are we saved and What's the basis of, of me being able to have a relationship with God? Uh, I'm not Jewish. What is that? What does the Old Testament mean? How does a Jewish person come into a right relationship with God? These are all very, very important and significant questions. And the most important question for us to ask is, what's going to happen when I die? You're going to have whatever happens in your life. Your life's going to be however long it is, but you're going to be in eternity for eternity. And are you, where are you going to spend that? Uh, do you believe in reincarnation, or do you believe that the, the soul just ceases to exist? Do you believe in a judgment? Do you believe in righteousness? And when a person dies, where do they go? And so the most important question is, what do I need to do to be saved? And this is, this is the, the purpose of this first part of the book of Romans, all the way up through chapter 8, is to uh, explain and teach very clearly what the, the message of salvation is. And here probably as much as any other place in the New Testament, is a very clear, carefully worded, significantly worded statement about, about how a person is saved. Key words like righteousness, the righteousness of God, and justification, to be made righteous. How is a person made righteous? God is a righteous God, and God demands righteousness, and God has provided for that righteousness. And, and there's a mistake that human beings make, and that's what Paul's going to be focusing on uh, dealing with, because it's, it's probably the primary mistake that the Jewish people made, and he's going to articulate it very clearly before we finish uh, this letter, uh, that they were seeking a self-righteousness. And that's a big challenge for most human beings, is being self-righteous. I've created my own standard that I can reach, and, and because I reach that standard... Therefore, I'm acceptable to God. But if God doesn't agree with you, it doesn't really matter what you think. Uh, you could tell the police, no, my standard of driving is different than everybody else's. Well, sorry, you don't make the laws. You're not the lawgiver. You're not the law enforcer. Yeah, but I feel like what I was doing was safe. Well, I don't feel like what you're doing. And I'm the policeman, and the judge is, rep- the law is the law, and you're under the law. You're- no one's above the law, or hopefully not. So... Uh, God is righteous, and God demands righteousness, and God has declared that there's a penalty and a consequence for being unrighteous. And Paul has made the point that all of us are unrighteous. And he's going to be repeating something through this, because one of the threads woven through this is the Jew and the Gentile. And the Jewish person and the Gentile are, are under sin, and he's already made that point up into this place where we are. Verse 22 and 23, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe there's no difference for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The first point he makes is Jew and Gentile are all sinful. The Jewish person, while they might have the law, they actually are probably, you'd say, sinning in a more accountable way or or more guilty because they actually know what God says. So they know that God said don't covet. So what's their excuse when they're coveting? They know that God said, don't bear false witness. So what's the excuse when they're lying? So knowing the truth doesn't make you less guilty when you break the law. The Bible says that actually makes you more guilty. Jesus said that himself. So the the point that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and that that's upon 
every single person, whether they're Jewish or Gentile. And now Paul be, is going to make the point of justification by faith. He's, he's made that point in the section that we just read, but now he's going to de- that's the first point that he develops and the main point that he develops. is This is how you get into a righteous standing with God. It's not by doing something, then you present that to God and go, look, I've, here's the standard and I've made the standard. If it, because the Bible, he's already made the point, here's the standard, no one makes the standard. So how do I make the standard? How do I make, how, would, how do I, I can declare myself righteous. Listen, I've, I've done, I'm a pastor, I've done lots of marriage, I don't kind of call it counseling, I'm not a counselor, so it's not counseling, I don't have a degree in counseling, so I've listened to people who were troubled in their marriage and had issues, and I've heard them explain, and I've, I've listened to many husbands who were sure they were right. And their wife was sure that they were not. And I was more inclined to agree with the wife. Uh, The guy thought, well, I don't know why she has a problem with this. Well, I think she's very reasonable having a problem with that. Just because you don't, well, I talked to three other guys at work. None of them think that there should be a problem. Well, listen, you can find people that agree with you, but if God doesn't agree with you, you could justify yourself all day long. If the offended party isn't going to be happy with your justification, then you didn't make peace, right? Right? So a person can justify themselves, and, and there's something about our human nature that craves uh, self-justification, and that's the first point that he makes going out of this section. He asks a question in verse 27. He says, where is boasting? You know, there's a lot of boasting that gets involved in religion. One of the reasons why people, if you invite them to church, they won't want to come is because there's a lot of boasting that goes on at church. Uh, and, and in not just Christianity, but there's a lot of boasting and elevating yourself that's involved in sort of any religious system because there's usually a standard that's set, wherever it's set, and the people that have sort of made their way to that standard, they're up above the other people looking down on them, and who wants to go to church and have that happen? I don't want to have that happen. I don't want to go to a church like that. You imagine walking into a church and everybody's looking down on you? Oh, look at what they're wearing. Oh, look at what they look like. Oh, look at them. I can't believe they're doing that. Jesus certainly didn't act like that. If there was anybody who was above the people, it would be Jesus, and Jesus made himself lower than the He made himself uh, beneath people so he could boost them up and point them toward the Lord. So where's boasting? That's the first question he asked, verse 27. He said, it's excluded. There's no place for boasting in the teaching of the gospel. Why? He says, because uh, of what, uh, by what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. The way that God's chosen to make us righteous leaves us with no boast. If somebody walked in and, 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 and they said, I need to give my life to the Lord and my life has just fallen apart, what's the message you're going to tell them? You're going to say, oh, hey, man, we're sorry your life's falling apart, but you came to the right place. Jesus will save you. He will, he will take your baggage. He will cleanse you. He will do a work in your life. Just surrender your life to the Lord. Yeah, but I'm not like you. You guys, everyone here looks so nice. You guys are all cleaned up. And like, no, no, we're super messed up. <laughs> you know, we're just like you. There's no difference between us and you. We just, we just have accepted Jesus. You can accept Jesus. We're all the same. There's no boasting. Who could boast? But in a religious system where you create a standard, and the Jewish people of Jesus' day, right, the Pharisees, they created a standard. They, they actually twisted the law to make it mean something it, that God never intended it to mean. And it was a standard that they could meet. And then climbing up to the top of that standard, they looked on that mountain down upon everybody else. And they were mad at Jesus because, Jesus, you're hanging around with these people. Jesus, you're with the tax collectors and sinners. We can see you way down there. From our perch, we've twisted the law to justify ourselves. The law was never intended to justify them. Paul makes it really clear that through the law comes the knowledge of sin. When the Bible says, thou shalt not and thou shalt not, and you start thinking, I think I've done a lot of those thou shalt nots. Maybe not to the degree of the person I'm comparing myself to. I see maybe a full-on criminal on death row or a mass murderer, and I look at that, and I go, well, I'm not like that. Yeah, but if I compare myself to a righteous God, and I am lost. You can't get more unrighteous than me. I'm as bad as it could possibly be if I compare myself to God's righteousness. So what kind of law? Of works? He says, no, he calls it a law of faith, which is an interesting way to put it. 
the principle is of faith. If you're trying to come to, the, to God on the basis of your works, we've already concluded that, that there's none righteous, not one. And so that door is closed. So what door is open? And Paul says the door of faith is opened. And he says in verse, eight, verse 28, therefore we conclude. So here's a conclusion he's making. And it's going to lead him into the point that he makes. And he's going to take this all the way to chapter 5. Verse 28 says, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. That you gain a right standing before God because of your trust in God and your confidence in what Jesus did that you could never gain by your works. So if you say, what works do I need to do? Remember the rich young ruler asked Jesus, what works do I need to do to have eternal life? And Jesus said to him, well, you know the commandments. And he knew the guy was a commandment breaker. And so the, he says, you know, don't murder, don't steal, don't covet. And the guy says, look, I did all of those. But Jesus didn't quote all Ten Commandments. See, the second statement of Jesus was, well, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Not that selling everything you have and giving it to the poor is going to make you saved, but what, when Jesus quoted the law to him, which is, have no other gods before me. Do you know anything you love more than you love God is your God? You can say, God is my God, but if you love money, it doesn't matter if you're a pastor or a tele-evangelist. If you love money, money's your God, and you're committing the greatest sin of all. You've got something in the place of God. Now, whatever it is. Now, it could be almost anything, right? It could be a sin. It could be a good thing. It could be a, your family. It could be another person. It could be a position. It could be some identity. Maybe you have your own identity that you want everybody to think of as, well, this is who I really am, and that becomes your God. It's more important than anything else. So anything that, that becomes the most important thing is God. So that's what happened for the rich young ruler. And Jesus is not telling him that, that the command is, obeying the command is going to be the way. Jesus is quoting the truth to him so that the guy would realize, no, I have something I love more than I love God. I'm a lawbreaker. Oh, Jesus, what does a lawbreaker do to get saved? <laughs> right? That would be the logical, honest answer but instead, the guy goes away sad because it says he had many possessions. Many possessions. And they were grabbing hold of his heart, and he, wasn't, you know, he was captured by a false god of materialism. We conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. And then jump forward to chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore. How did verse 28 start? Therefore. <laughs> Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So what we're going to have between these two therefores, justified by faith, is going to be a, a teaching of, of, of the, how the law shows us the very thing that Paul is saying. Even the law itself testifies that it's justification by faith. He, he says that, and jump back to chapter 3, verse 21, the first verse that I read tonight in that section we had been studying. The righteousness of God, he says, apart from the law is revealed, but notice the end of verse 21. It's being witnessed, though, by the law and the prophets. So what the message of Jesus is, it's not that Jesus came on the scene on a certain time period and did something that was totally different than the law. The law said this, and, and that, that didn't work, and so God's plan B was Jesus, and you got saved one way when there was the law, but now Jesus is here, it's a new way. The only way to be saved ever is justification by faith. That's the only way anybody, if anyone ever got saved, Adam and Eve, all the way till the last person, the only way to get saved is to be declared right by God by believing in what God has said. Because nobody could keep the law. And the whole basis of the law was to show you that you need, uh, you need some kind of sacrifice for your sin. So the sacrifices for sin that were offered were offered in faith. None of those sacrifices could take away someone's sin. There's a priesthood there, but those priests, they all died there. They don't have an eternal priesthood. Their priesthood is faulty. And all of those things that were given even in the law, they were all pointing ultimately to Jesus. But Paul's not going to point to the law. He's going to use the law, but the law doesn't just talk about from the time of Moses. You guys, are, we just studied the five books of Moses, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Where does Moses and the law come in? 
Book number two, Exodus, right? Book number one, it's in the law. It's in the five books of Moses, the Torah. But there's no law yet, right? Who's the main character in the book of Genesis? The most important character to the nation of Israel, the father of the nation of Israel. His name's Abraham. And Abraham has an experience with God. And God, of, of all the people who've ever lived, this guy is one of the very few people where God said that he's saved. <laughs> you don't have to wonder where Abraham is because God said he was saved because God made a promise to him. He believed God and God counted it to him for righteousness. So in the law, before the law, the law is given in book two of the law, before the law is given, within the five books of Moses, we have the account of Abraham and what does Abraham find out? And that's what Paul's going to talk about. And this is important to his argument about Jew and Gentile. Remember, Jew and Gentile are all in sin. Well, Jew and Gentile all get saved the same way. He says in verse 29, again, in the form of a question, he said, is God the God of the Jews only? What's your, what's your answer to that question? I hope you have the right answer. Is God the God of the Jews only? No. Aren't you glad? <laughs> I'm not Jewish. I'm really glad that that's a rhetorical question. The answer is implied, and the answer is no. God's not the God of the Jews only. Is God the God of the Jews? Yeah. He's their God. He revealed himself to, the, to them. He called Abraham. He made him a great nation. He kept his promises to Abraham. He gave them the law. He even gave them a king when they rejected him and said, we want a king. He even gave them David to be their king. He's given them many, many, many promises. He brought the Messiah through them into the world to be the savior of the world. They, they, have, a, they have a place, and, a, and, and it's an important place, but God's not the God of the Jews only. He asks the other question, is he not also the God of the Gentiles? And then he answers that one, I'm glad. Maybe he answered that one because a lot of people would say, I'm, I'm not sure he is. I'm a Gentile, so I'm speaking for, I can, I can comment on that one. I can't comment so much on the Jewish one because I'm not Jewish, but I'm so glad Paul said, yes, he is. He's the God of the Gentiles also. Since there is one God, verse 30, who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. So how are, how are the, those that are circumcised, they've got the covenant of Abraham, and they've, they know that they're descended from Abraham, how are they justified, he says, by faith? What about the pagan? What about the person who didn't know about God? Or maybe they knew and they didn't care and they just did whatever they wanted. How are they going to be justified by faith? Exactly the same. All are under sin and all get saved the same way. So then he says in verse 31, he, he's asking a question, anticipating someone's question. He says, do we make or do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. This is a really important concept. There has to be a basis for any relationship. If you showed up to, at my house tonight at 1030 and you expect to come in and uh, make yourself a bowl of cereal and hang out and watch TV, uh, I'm not letting you in. And you might say, well, what? come on now. I go, to the ch I go to church. You're the pastor. You should let me in. I want in fact, I like cereal. I heard you have some cereal and I just want to be here. No, you don't have any basis. Uh, did I invite you? No. Did you get in? Is there a party? Like, is, what? No, I just felt like I could be able to come over. I'm sorry. You're not coming in. I don't, wanna, I don't want you here at 1030. I'm about to go to bed, and I don't want you eating my cereal. And uh, come, you know, let, let's make an appointment for later uh, at the police station. And I'll, we'll, we can talk at, while I'm filling out the restraining order. Right? If someone's going to have a relationship, both people have to be in. Otherwise, it's called a stalker <laughs> or some other thing. You can't just say, I have a relationship with God, and God says, I don't think you do. Right? There has to be a basis. What's the basis? What are you standing on? What's the rock? Is there anything that you can stand on and say, I'm standing on something. I have a relationship with God. Well, on what basis do you have a relationship with God? You know, you might say, I have, a, I have a relationship with Rich. Well, on what, what basis? Well, I've known him since I was in high school. You know, I, he seen him, you know, he's known me my whole entire life almost. I'm thinking of, a, of Alicia. You know, I've known her husband since he was in junior high. Like, she could tell the story. Like, then someone go, okay, I guess you know him. You know, I guess. I guess you can have cereal. You can go show up. I would let you guys in. 
You guys could come over, but there has to be. There's some kind of. There's some kind of a foundation. What? What's the uh, the standing? Do you have standing? And Paul says, when we say that everyone's justified by faith, we're not saying that the law is neutralized or nullified or or has no power. He says, in fact, we're establishing the law. And literally, the word establish means to stand up. We're establishing it. We're s- the standing, the law has standing, and nothing about justification by faith undermines the power of the law, the righteousness of the law. You see, when God forgives us on the basis of our faith in Jesus Christ, the law is validated because Jesus' death on the cross. God judged sin. God said, I will judge sin. The soul that sins, it shall surely die. The penalty for sin is death. The law is justified in the sense that it's established, in the sense that it's, I'm going to say validate is too, not the right word, but, but it's, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, I'm trying to think of other synonyms. Uh, the idea is that uh, we're confirming it. We're saying, yes, the law. There's nothing wrong with it. But I still get saved even though I'm a lawbreaker because of the gospel. Because Jesus Christ came and fulfilled the law by paying the just penalty according to the law for sin. And now a lawbreaker like me, by trusting in what Jesus did, without taking away the validity of the law, I now can have a right relationship with God. So if someone comes to our church and says, your haircut's not the right haircut. You're not dressed the right way. You don't do the right thing on the right day. They didn't baptize you with the right magic words. The right person didn't baptize you on the right day. You don't do, I mean, whatever it might be that someone might say, we say, oh, no, 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 no. We're saved by what God did through his son, Jesus Christ on the cross. That's the basis of my salvation. There's no other basis of my salvation. That my salvation is completely built upon what Jesus did on the cross for me. And there is nothing else. That's what my salvation is built on. That's the standing. So, and that, that doesn't make void the law, actually. That validates the law. It doesn't take away from the law and say, well, you know, when God said that, he didn't really mean that. I mean, you know, you, uh, we've got all kinds of different things going on on different courts. We have some people that bribe, pay all kinds of thousands of dollars to bribe uh, you know, institutions to get their kids into college, that's all going to court. They pleaded not guilty. Okay, but, you know, like when they get to court, you know what's going to happen. Whoever's got the big money is going to get a good lawyer. Like, well, what does is mean? Well, here, what is the emails? Well, it looks like you have the employee. Eh, they, you can't imply that. Well, let's make a deal. Have a plea bargain, right? right then you think of all these different things. The, the president, uh, I think just today, the Congress voted to you know, say something about the attorney general. They want him to come, and now there's it's a big political, how oh, we're saying this, and this person saying that. Democracy's on trial. Like, I'm not, I don't know what any of you guys think about anything. But we know that truth is all relative when it comes to men, but not with God. And God says, it is. The soul that sins, it shall surely die. Period. And all of us have sinned. We've already proven that. The first three chapters, right? The Jew is under sin. The, the Gentile is under sin. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But there's a way the lawbreakers can be saved, and it establishes the law. Paul says we're not taken away from the law. In fact, he now goes to give an illustration. He uses Abraham. He asks a question in chapter 4, verse 1. What shall we say that Abraham, our father, has found according to the flesh? So he said, let's go back to the law. And we'll go back to the most important person who has a relationship with God, Abraham, the father of all the Jewish people. He said, if Abraham, verse 2, if Abraham was justified by his works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. <laughs> now, you guys have studied the Bible. Abraham is uh, he's not righteous. I, I, I think when I had heard, I, rem, I didn't grow up in the church, but I remember uh, I had some friends when I first got saved, and a lot of them had, were raised in the church, so sometimes it would be on the high school uh, Partridge family 1970s bus, you know, the first couple of months I was saved, our youth pastor took us on a couple of outings in this thing, and these kids were all singing songs they were raised with, and one of the songs was Father Abraham had many sons, and you know, marching, and one, two, and all the whole, I didn't know the words of the song, and and I remember you know, hearing about Abraham, but I was shocked when I first read the Bible and the guy just totally bailed on his wife. 
You know, like, just say you're my sister. You're hot. I don't want to have anything happen to me. <laughs> and I remember reading that thinking, dude, you did not do that twice? Then I read it later, a couple of words, thinking, dude, did it twice? Like, how'd you have any teeth after the first time to be like, hey, then let's go on the Like, she didn't, pow. Like, you say, she, she goes into some other guy's harem. Yeah, I don't know if she's my sister, you know. Good luck, honey. Uh, see you on the other side. It's okay with me. That's Abraham. Uh, he's not a righteous man. He, he would have something to boast about, but he doesn't. In verse 3, Paul quotes the law. This is from Genesis. Very significant. He says, what does the scripture say? And this is Genesis 15. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Here's somebody in the Bible that God said, that is righteousness given to you. And it was on what basis? He believed. And what actually did he believe? If you go back and read Genesis 15, he believed a promise. About what? So shall thy seed be. He took him out and showed him the stars and said, so shall thy seed. Seed singular. Not these are all your descendants, but your descendant. You see this mass? Something's going to happen through one descendant that's going to lead to something amazing. And Abraham believed in the promise about the one descendant who has come. Who's the one descendant coming of Abraham? That if you believe in him, you'll be declared righteous. His name is Jesus. I've believed in Jesus. Abraham believed in a promise about Jesus. We both have been declared righteous by our faith in Jesus Christ. I'm saved the exact same way as Abraham is saved. The law does not come until the next book. The law doesn't come for four, over 400 years. That's the point Paul's going to make here. In verse 4, he goes on. He's going to make several points about just the logic of this. He says, not, not to him who works, but... Or wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. So when you work, you're, you're expecting to get paid. But to him who does not work, verse 5, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. There's a really important phrase in verse 5. God justifies who? They're described for you. It's right in the middle of the verse. They, who, he who believes on him who justifies the ungodly. Now, what kind of people are on the planet? There's only one kind. What kind? They're ungodly kind. <laughs> We've been separated from God by sin, and now we're far away from God, and, and we're ignorant of God, and because we're far away from God and ignorant of God, we become unlike God. When people are doing the things that they do, they're so unlike God, you have to say this, that people no longer have, have a knowledge of God. They've been separated from Him by sin. Now they're ungodly. But God has made a way that doesn't make void the law so he can justify ungodly people. But you can't justify ungodly people. Ungodliness must be judged. Unrighteousness will be judged. God demands righteousness. God is a righteous God. We would have to take God's righteousness and make it not be righteousness if he was going to accept us any other way. But God is righteous, and God's provided a way for ungodly people to be justified, and that's by the righteous Jesus taking the place of the unrighteous me and dying in my place and paying the penalty for my sin. And then he also says David. Now he goes outside the law, beyond the law. So Abraham is the example, the prime example. But then he quotes David. And David is also notorious. You think of David. I remember not knowing much about David. Again, I, I, I think I had an advantage getting saved and not knowing anything about the Bible. Because when I first read the Bible, I was kind of shocked at some of these guys. Because I, you know, I'd hear from my friends that they're singing songs, and I was thinking, oh, David and Goliath. Yeah, I finally heard that story and read. But you know, after you get done with David and Goliath, David, it, you start thinking David and Bathsheba. There's David and a whole bunch of other stuff going on. David and, yeah, David's a hero, but David, David's not allowed to build the temple because he murdered so many people. God flat out tells him, you have blood on your hands, and you're guilty. You can't build the temple. But David says this, David describes, verse 6, the blessedness of the man to whom the Lord imputes righteousness apart from works. You see, David in Psalm 32 was guilty of sin, but he says this, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. And blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. You can be forgiven of all your sins and God won't hold them against you. You can be forgiven 
for all of your sins, no matter what you've done, and God won't hold it against you. In fact, they'll be separated from you that God never remembers them again. They'll never be brought up by God again. He asks a question in verse 9. Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only? Talking about the Jew, using circumcision as the sign of that covenant. Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only or upon the uncircumcised also? Remember, he's talking about the Jew and the Gentile both being able to be saved. He says, we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. And he's using Abraham as an example. Verse 10, how then was it accounted? When did God make this counting? When did God say, you're righteous? Was he circumcised or uncircumcised? You guys know the answer? Abraham's famous for getting circumcised, right? He's the first. He's the father of the family. He gets circumcised, and his son Isaac gets circumcised. When did Abraham get circumcised? It's after Genesis 15. Abraham's uncircumcised, and God declares him righteous. Now, that throws a monkey wrench in the whole idea of, I'm Jewish, and so because I'm Jewish, I'm, the, I'm just righteous by my circumcision, and because I've, got, I've, I've made the law sort of serve my purpose, I've brought a standard down that I can meet in my own mind, even though I probably don't even meet that standard, but it satisfies me. I've got my own righteousness that satisfies me. I've got circumcision. I've got a Jewish identity. And Paul just <clears throat> blows it up and says, Abraham was declared righteous, and he was uncircumcised. Before the law, 400 years before the law comes, and when Abraham himself has not made a covenant with God, that happens later in chapter 15 even, Abraham is declared righteous because he believes, period. That's the testimony of Abraham. I was declared righteous when I believed in God's promise concerning his son Jesus Christ. And he didn't know as much as we know, but he was believing in what God revealed to him and God declared him righteous it wasn't while he was circumcised, but while he was uncircumcised. Verse 11 tells us the purpose for him of circumcision. He received the sign of circumcision, and he calls it a seal of the righteousness of faith, which he had while he was uncircumcised, that he might become the father of all those who believe, though they're uncircumcised, that the righteousness might be imputed to them also, and the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but also who walk in the steps of the faith, which our father Abraham had while he was still uncircumcised. So we can truly say Abraham is our father. I'm not, I'm not a descendant of Abraham in terms of being part of the Jewish nation and the, the covenant that God made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a son of Abraham by faith. I've followed his example, even though I'm not Jewish. And a person who's Jewish could say, well, I'm also following Abraham's example of faith like that, my Gentile friend, and we're both Abraham's sons by faith. But the person who isn't following by faith, even if they're Jewish, they're outside of that relationship with God that's by faith, the righteousness that comes by faith. He says in verse 13, the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. And that's the point that he's making related to the promise that was made in Genesis 15 that's reiterated in Genesis 17 is not connected to the sign of circumcision or to the law, but actually it's a promise made by God that has nothing to do with the law. It's before the law and it's before circumcision. He says in verse 14, if those who are of the law are heirs, if, that is if you become part of that by following the law, he says in verse 14 that faith is made void and the promise has become of no effect because the law brings about wrath, and where there's no law, there's no transgression. Therefore, it's of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who's the father of us all. So he's connecting the dots for us to say, all, are, all have sinned, but, but now look at Abraham. How, did he, how was he declared righteous? By believing. And he didn't have the sign of the covenant, he didn't have the law, but he believed in a promise about the Messiah, and God, God imputed righteousness to him. So anybody who believes in that same Messiah is going to have righteousness imputed to them, whether they're circumcised or uncircumcised. That's the way to life. And the law, in fact, brings about wrath. So the person who knows the law knows, man, I'm a lawbreaker. 
I broke the law today. I was on the freeway. I seriously broke it the whole time I was on the freeway. Well, once I got to a certain number that I went past. Now, well, it's the flow of traffic. You know, you're it's, I mean, right? You just, what are you going to, you could have all these excuses. But the law, if the law is the law, if the law says thou shalt not steal and you ever stole, you ever took something ever one time that didn't belong to you, you're a lawbreaker and you're under the penalty of death. Jesus took it even deeper and said, actually, the way God interprets it is if it happens in your heart. God sees adultery in my heart. He sees murder in my heart. He just sees, sees pride in my heart. He sees covetousness in my heart. God sees my heart, not just my actions. God sees everything. So I'm guilty. But faith makes, makes me have a, a hope that I can be justified because I believed in the same one that Abraham believed in And then he says in verse 17, because God had promised him he'd be the father of many nations. Paul's talking about that, that that goes beyond just the nation of Israel. It's written, I've made you a father of many nations in the presence of him who believed God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. We'll we'll come back next week and look more about Abraham's example. There's a tremendous application here, but we're going to just stick with Paul's argument. We'll kind of move through this without... So really wonderful uh, encouragement about perseverance here. But verse 18, contrary to hope, in hope he believed so that he might become the father of many nations according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. Not being weak in faith, you know, he was almost 100 years old, it says, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He didn't waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform and therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. So he has a seal of circumcision. He uh, believes and, and he keeps trusting the Lord. You can see his faith keep working itself out, where even at 100 years old, they, they have the child Isaac. And we see him even later. He offers up Isaac as a sacrifice. So he's believing all along, and you see it. But when was he declared righteous? Not when he offers up Isaac. Not when he has a baby. Not when he makes a covenant with God. Not when he's circumcised. He's declared righteous at the beginning when he believes. And his his faith, you see it working all along, but the declaration of righteousness is back at the beginning. Then he goes on. He says, verse 23, this is important. This was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. Abraham, you might say, was taking one for the team or getting one for the team, I guess. So here he is for all humanity. He's the person that God chose to reveal to all the people who would ever live that righteousness is given to a person when they believe. Abraham, this one person, all of humanity, Jew or Gentile, righteous or unrighteous, or however people perceive themselves, this statement that God made to him, it was imputed to him, was written for us. Verse 24, he goes on, it shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up our Lord Jesus, or Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised up because of our justification. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. A person is brought to a place of having peace with God, not by what they do. And this is really important for all of us because the devil knows that our strength is in grace. And our standing is in grace. And he's constantly wanting to pull us out of that back into some kind of works mentality of, all right, well, I've, I've had people in our congregation come up to me and say, I, I know I haven't been at church, but, and I know I probably I can't even ask, but, man, we just need prayer. I'm like, dude, the basis of prayer is not church attendance. Otherwise, all my prayers would be answered. <laughs> I'm here all the time. I work here. I'm here during the week, man. My prayers would be answered right now if being in the building meant that you were getting your prayers answered. What's the basis? What's the standing, right? We talked about that. I mean, this is really important biblically. What's the basis for answered prayer? God loves you. He wants to bless you. He wants to work in your life. He wants you to cry out to him. He invites you to pray. Jesus invites you to pray about anything, big or small. He says, pray for your daily bread. 
He said, even the hairs of your head are numbered. God, if God cares about something so insignificant as my hairs that are falling out, knows how many there are at any given moment, if he's so aware of what I'm going through that even my hairs are, are counted, he's, he's presenting to me a concept that, look, I've, I've made an open door. Sin was separating you. You were, you were infinitely away from God. I've made it so that you can come back to me through, through my son Jesus Christ, directly to me on the basis of what he did. So you can pray about it. You could, you, could be, you could be totally backslidden and be in jail. You better be praying if you go to jail. That would be a great time to start praying. Oh, it's a jailhouse conversion. Amen. Would to God there was more. <laughs> Have one. You know what's also is good? The back of a police car conversion. That's a great place to go, you know what? I've come to my senses. Lord, you're in control. I don't know what the judge is going to say. I don't know what they're going to do about this. I don't know what my lawyer can do. I might be in for a few years. All right, Lord, you got my life. I'm, I'm all in. You know what's even better? Before you commit the crime. When they're staging, they go, man, we can go like that. And you're like, you know what? I don't think I want to do this anymore. Or I think I'd rather go get donuts. That kept me from going to jail once. <laughs> Winchells. I've always had a fondness in my heart for uh, Winchells. I feel like they saved my life. I was like 14 years old, and my friends went to go burg burglar a house. And... Uh, me and my buddy, we were like, I was, I was like, I was kind of tired, and I had ridden my bike already over to my buddy's house, like three miles, and Winchell's was between my house and my buddy's house, and I thought, like my friend, I go, let's go, let's go to Winchell's. He goes, yeah, I was thinking the same thing. And we got like a dozen donuts, and you know, we're 14, we scarfed down on these donuts, and our buddies got arrested. And one of the guys, he stole a car to go rob this house, and then he got, man, they got in big trouble. You know, it's a great, it's great to, to, you know, at some point along the way, like, well, you, you know, I hope my friend is saved today, but, you know, the guy that I ate, I ate Winchell's with, he's dead. You know, at some point, you need to get right with the Lord. But God will justify the ungodly. There's only ungodly people. There's ungodly Jewish people, un ungodly Gentiles. That's all there is. Now, some people might think, I read a, a guy, a Bible teacher today, was using an analogy that he, he said, if you, if you want to leave California, going up in altitude or going down in altitude does not take you out of California. For example, if you went down to Death Valley and you say, man, I'm all the way in Death Valley. I got to get out of here. I got to get out of California. I'm, at the, I'm below sea level. And so you climb and you get to sea level and you look around and you go, well, I'm still in California. And then you climb all the way to the top of Mount Whitney. And you're at the highest point in the lower 48 states. And you go, well, I'm higher than everybody else. And I'm higher than those idiots down in Death Valley. But I'm, you're still in California. If you want to get out of California, you're going to have to leave California. And he was making the point that you're in dis if, if, if there's destruction, the state of destruction, and you want to be in life, you might be in the state of destruction. You might be higher than everybody else. You're at, you know, I went to college, and I got a good job, and I took care of my kids, and I paid my bills. And you're all the way up on top of Mount Whitney, and you're looking at all the other fools and going, what a bunch of idiots and losers. I'm higher up on the altitude than them. You're here. You're, there's, only, there's only the city of destruction. It doesn't matter how high or low you are. You've got to leave that state and get saved. And there's only one way to be saved. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Is that exclusive? No, it's inclusive. Anyone who wants to can come. Rich, poor, male, female, no discrimination whatsoever. Anybody who wants to get saved, the door is wide open. You can come right through. Self-righteous people can't come. They won't come. Because this way is God imputes righteousness when you believe in Jesus, the righteous one. There's no boasting. Which, by the way, there shouldn't be boasting in our midst, right? We should all, be, you know, there's no promotions. Hey, man, we're all the same. We're all... We're all dead in our trespasses, sinners. In, and you might say, well, I'm higher than you. Well, definitely you're higher than me. I, that's not, there's no argument there. But if you're still in the state of destruction, you've got to leave, and there's only one way out. The bridge goes across an infinite chasm, and the bridge is the cross of Jesus Christ. And any person can walk across that and go to life. But too many people are over here, and they look around, they find Adolf Hitler down at the bottom and some other terrible person, and they go, well, I'm not that. I never murdered anybody. I never poisoned anybody. Well, yeah, but <laughs> you're a sinner. Well, not like you. Well, I'm not the standard, thank God. <laughs> you know,
You know what the standard is? God. And God's righteous, and God demands righteousness, but God's loving, and God's provided a way for us to be saved. We can have peace with God, justified by faith. So uh, I wanted to kind of go through this all in one chunk so that you could see how his argument unfolds. It's genius. And this would be something that I, I would encourage you to take a little time on your own, read through it, and kind of Understand the points that he's making because one of the great challenges at all times for every congregation of people who's trying to follow Jesus is, is the temptation to legalism, the temptation to self-righteousness, the temptation to self-justification. We will have, a, I would say, on a weekly basis, maybe, but for sure on a monthly basis, people that will come into our gathering on our Sunday morning is the biggest gathering when you have so many people come and go, guests or whatever, well, at least on a monthly basis, but I think it's probably more weekly, guests will come who have some version of legalism that they want with all their heart to introduce to this congregation. Thankfully, we have godly leaders, male and female, who God has gifted with a gift of discernment. They have a gift of prophecy. They know the word of God. They're mature. And God seems to have us all around in the room and people that usually the right person runs into that person first before anything else. And, and can be able to say, hey, not, not here, and not ever. <laughs> We're, we don't believe that. There, there's no basis for boasting, right? There's no other way. We're all sinners, Jew or Gentile, but thank God there's a way that any person could be saved. I can preach the gospel to anybody. It doesn't matter what color they are. It doesn't, God, wants every, God made all the human beings. We're all equal, and God wants all of us saved. And, and he's made it so that he can, he can do it in a righteous way. He's, he doesn't make void the law because of the death of Jesus. Redemption and propitiation, remember what we studied the last few weeks? Those are very key words. Justification, these words are all made possible by, the, by what Jesus did when he died for us. So we're now justified with God by faith. That's the point of this section. He's, he, he, he shows everyone's under sin. He makes that great explanation of the gospel. And then he develops this argument about justification by faith. And then he's going to get into a bunch of practical things uh, in the next few chapters of how this works out in our lives. So, Father, help us to uh, take heed to your word and to the truth of the, of the gospel. And thank you that the church is the, I think as Paul said in, to Timothy, is the, the pillar and the ground of the truth. Lord, help us to share the truth with people and invite them to open their hearts to, to salvation and to, to being made right with God, to be able to have peace with God, to not say, well, I hope one day I'll be accepted by God. I hope I could be good enough and God will accept me. Lord, many of us know we'll never be good enough. It would never happen. God would never accept me. I've been the opposite of being acceptable. But some people, some people have a soft conscience and they hope, they they hope that one day, maybe if they're good enough, but Lord, the truth, you've declared it, that anyone in Jesus Christ, that God has imputed righteousness, sin is forgiven, and there's grace, and there's a standing. Lord, as Paul said, we didn't, he didn't nullify the, the law, or, or uh, he, in fact, he establishes the law, or stands up the law. Lord, thank you that, that you're able to make a stand that you, Lord, have sealed us with the Holy Spirit. Like Abraham had the sign of his faith, his circumcision, we have the, the sealing of the Holy Spirit, the sign of our faith. Lord, we thank you for the work of salvation, and we pray that you'd help us to hold on to the truth and share the truth. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.